we were looking, uh, Dory and I have been researching for a while, trying to build a keyboard that would uh, be portable, something that you could bring with an iPad, and yet be a little bit more playable than the standard sort of mini, mini keyboard that you can find on the market today. Two and three octaves is pretty standard. But we all, I, I found when I was playing these mini keyboards is that, that they, they kind of look like a piano keyboard when you hold them far away, but as, you, as your hand gets closer, you realize it, it, it's, it really doesn't feel like, for any kind of, anybody who plays the keyboard regularly, you, you find that this is a kind of a compromised shape. Uh, the arc of your hand that doesn't fit on the white keys, and it just feels cramped. You're really kind of struggling to play it. And, and looking at keyboards for a while, I noticed most everybody that kind of shrunk a keyboard down to a portable size did the same thing. They just kind of made it look just like a regular piano keyboard and just made everything smaller. They scaled the whole thing down. So we were playing around with it and it occurred to me that maybe the proportions does, don't necessarily have to be locked in. It makes something look like a keyboard, but maybe uh, you could uh, play around with the proportions a little bit and enhance the playability of a keyboard even though it gets smaller. And doing some research on this, I was fascinated to find out that actually around the turn of the century, and indeed during like Mozart, Beethoven, all these guys were, were not necessarily composing on a six and a half inch octave keyboard. So six and a half inches is the standard piano octave that we're stuck with. That's from the edge of the C key to the edge of the B key above it. Six and a half inches from uh, edge to edge. Somehow we're stuck with this keyboard, which really was only suitable for people like Chopin and Liszt who were like six five and had monster hands. So uh, in the, around the turn of the century, there were some small piano companies making what they called ladies pianos that were um, adjusted. They just made the, a whole, the keyboard narrower, uh, all the keys a lot narrower, down to as little as four and three quarter inches, so sub sub substantially narrower than the current keyboard. And it made it a lot easier for most normal mortals to play. You can, you, your people who have trouble re reaching an octave now would have no trouble on the ladies keyboard. So, these mini keyboards don't suffer that problem. They're all narrower in pitch. But I found that there, was, there just isn't enough sort of the white key in the front. It's just a little too small. And most piano players, you don't spend very much time at the top of the black keys. You really spend a lot of time down here on the white keys. So we, were pl we, we played around with it and thought if we can go ahead and make the, the thing narrower to make, fit the size of an iPad, because an iPad is really not very big, and getting two octaves in there is just, you know, probably pushing the limits of narrowness, but try and preserve the playability that you have of a piano keyboard by preserving as much of the white key length in front. Uh, I think we've hit upon maybe a, a good recipe for something that makes something, the keyboard a lot more playable in a very portable form factor. Um, another key thing about the keyboard is it really, I think pianists really like when the key travels a good bit. So you want as much as possible a full key travel. Uh, and the big problem with full travel in a small keyboard is, well, it's got to be pretty thick. The, the typical piano key moves up and down about half an inch at the uh, tip. So getting something, you know, that looks nice and portable like this, you can see this isn't even half an inch thick. So you're never going to get half an inch of, move, of movement out of a key that fits in there. So play, faced with this dilemma, we kind of scratched our heads thinking, well, what are, what are the way, what are the options? And immediately the idea, like, well, maybe the keys can pop up, and like maybe the black keys can pop up, or maybe both keys can pop up. Somehow can we get something that collapses into the space? And we kind of looked in the market and thought, well, surely somebody has solved this problem before. Like, you know, we're not the first people who want a portable keyboard. It doesn't look like anybody has. There was a small, we, we did find a cool little Japanese keyboard, a really, really tiny thing where the black keys themselves collapsed. But, Nothing that really addressed the travel issue on both keys and nothing that got anywhere near uh, piano key collapsibility. So we scratched it, we thought about it for a little while. This is kind of an early prototype. Um, we started with where we also did the same thing. We maintained the ratio. These keys are actually almost the, the same length as a full piano key, uh, a lot of the white key in front. But then I, I think we, did, we, we put too much of the black, there's too much black key. We, we, in the later design, we refined it and realized that we could probably shorten the black key without compromising playability too much. So this is where we are right now. And what we figured out what to do is, basically it's a complex series of three linked four bar linkages, if that makes sense. So it's basically two parallelograms front and back 
linked by a series of, of a trapezoidal parallelogram in here. It's really more complicated to say than actually it's a pretty complicated period. Um, but if you look at the motion of this guy as he collapses, you can sort of see how the keys collapse into the space. And that linkage allows us, uh, we can expand the keyboard to up to, so that we have travel and the thickness of the keyboard can be up to three times the thickness of the package that it comes in. So this 10 millimeter box, 10 millimeter thick box, from this 10 millimeter thick box emerges this relatively thick substantial keyboard. Now obviously the keys are themselves pretty thin, <laughs> But uh, the pianist really only touches the top surface. So, you know, some pianists spend a little bit of time touching the edge of the black key, but we think that compromise is a, is a fairly modest one. Plus, it kind of looks cool to see through the keys, I think, you know, seeing how the thing works underneath. But really, it's just sort of a beautiful motion, having that whole thing collapse into very little space. But at the end, when it's, once it's up, you have something which really moves and feels like a piano. You can play chords. I, you know, now with my, I don't have very large hands, and octaves are trivial, now I can actually do a, ten, a, a tenth, or even a, well, tenth are easy, but uh, even the, um, the Holy Grail, which is the octave and a fifth. Um, you can do some interesting things, and I think by, you know, I don't think anybody's ever experienced a keyboard where the keys are still fairly spacious front to back, so you can really get the full arc of your hand on it. Uh, just the way that every piano teacher tells you, you know, hold like, like you're holding a golf ball or a tennis ball in your hand, have that nice arc. You have to have enough white key in front for that to work. And I think we sort of struck a good balance there. Certainly I think it's territory worth exploring more, but really this keyboard feels great. Um, now, coupled with making a keyboard that goes through this motion is a lot of complexity involved in no, how, we, how you detect where the key is, how fast it's going down, because most MIDI controllers really want to know at the very least how fast the key is moving, velocity sensitivity. And for that, the, the way it's typically done, uh, you usually have two switches which close in sequence, one shortly after the other, and you're just scanning around and you, you just sort of time the delay between those two switch closures, and that tells you how fast the key is moving. We looked at trying to do that. It's actually really complicated when everything moves. So this, this whole bit is, is, is moving through complex motions. There's a, the black keys move through a 70, de a 70 degree arc. The white keys move through a full 90 degree arc. There's a whole chunk in the middle here that has to move with it. So in looking to find solutions to that problem, we looked at alternatives. So we looked at certainly Hall effect sensors and optical detectors. And uh, the beauty of those latter two is that they don't require any physical contact between the actuator, the key itself, and the detector itself. You can actually, they can be, first of all, they can change an angle, and they don't really care. So it, if you get the geometry right, you can play around with that. But not having physical contact, not requiring a plunger to be pushed and a switch to be closed, uh, simplifies the design a little bit, ironically. It, it causes headaches for the electrical engineers, but that's why we have you know, brilliant electrical engineers to solve those problems for us. Um, and the other problem is how you get a spring action. Uh, we ripped apart a couple of keyboards that are, have the, the Holy Grail is weighted wood action keys or weighted action keyboards. Uh, and I would have loved to figure out a way to get sort of anti-gravity little keys in this space, but there's, there's, it's such a small package. Um, quickly we realized that you can't sort of do the inverted steel hammer approach that is used on some of those keyboards. Um, so we wanted something that would still feel a little bit better. This is, this is a very nice keyboard. It's pretty well done. As many keyboards go, it's, it's pretty good. But it, its spring action really is done entirely by um, rubber, collapsing a rubber dome and then the bending the plastic itself. So the plastic itself, the key itself, just is, is basically just a bent piece of plastic. And that is the spring. And you can sort of feel that when you push those things down. Like it, it gets a little stiffer as it goes down. There's a certain sort of rigidity that you don't get with a piano key. A piano key is really just a lever floating in space, and it's got a little weight at one end, and, and when you push it, the only resistance you really feel is the inertia of the key itself, and there's a, there's a certain, there's a, there's a organicness to that motion that you really, that pianists get used to, uh, because all you have to really do is get the key moving, and then its own inertia kind of propels it down further. Um, there's some hammers, some other actions moving in there, which creates some other subtleties and such secondary touches, but so we're trying to figure out if there, is there a way to get some of that feel uh, approximate that feel with, uh, through other means. We started with this guy which had uh, a traditional leaf spring 
um, just a bent piece of steel and an arch. It was the only thing we could think of that would collapse flat and then when you expanded it, the, the spring would wind up and create a little bit of tension for the keys. Um, of course, multiplied by 24, all those springs create a lot of tension that you have to, to, uh, to wind up to, get this, to get, give you the tension. So it was a challenge to deploy this. We had a couple interesting mechanisms to pull the, the keyboards into position. Uh, but exploring it further, Jory had the idea of, uh, you know, well, it started sort of almost as a, as a joke, like, well, what about magnetic repulsion, you know, that, that just the two opposing magnets, two north-facing magnets, um, they create lots of repulsion forces. There's no, con no physical contact between the two elements, and yet you get a lot of force between those two things. And uh, after sort of dismissing it for a little while, we looked a little more seriously at it, and it turns out it's a very compelling uh, solution to this particular problem, particularly to this unique problem of having the geometry of all the different pieces and looking just inside change dramatically throughout from the two positions. So the, the posts, if you will, that have to support the spring action of this key, they have to be vertical and they've got to stand up here, but then they have to all lie down and disappear into nothing. They all have to fit inside of 10 millimeter closure. So the only way that was going to work is if that whole thing, which is fairly tall, uh, you know, up to 30 millimeters, rotates down 90 degrees and lies flat. And magnets, uh, because they don't require any physical contact between the keys themselves, the magnets in the key, and the magnets in the posts, uh, were kind of a good solution to that problem. Um, they introduced plenty of their own little complexities, but uh, they really uh, create a simple, simpler mechanism. And another wonderful side effect is that you can play around with the spring tension. You can get a nice feel with mag the magnetic repulsion is different from a steel spring or any kind of passive uh, spring. It, it, you can play around with it and get a really kind of smooth feel. It's not weighted action, but it's, it's uh, an improvement, we think, over the standard friction or linear spring, bar spring, um, in this case, living hinge spring. And um, there's the potential to even have adjustability with a magnet just by changing the spacing between the, the magnets. Um, we can change the tension between the black and the white keys very easily. Uh, there's lots of tuning potential, but mostly it just creates a great feel. Like you really play around with this and it just feels nice. For something that's so small and so light, you get a little bit of resistance, but it, you don't get the, the, the sense that you're bending something. You get the sense more that something's moving. It's, it's, close, it's getting closer to the feel of an inertial motion. So we have this, uh, we think, a pretty compelling idea, a very small package with a uh, some reasonable complexity, but uh, buys you a very, very portable keyboard. So here we have two of our prototypes using clear keys. We love clear keys because they think, we think they look really cool, uh, but they actually serve a pretty useful debugging purpose um, for a mechanical engineer and potentially also an electrical engineer. Uh, you can see through the whole key and see the mechanism inside. So as you roll this thing through its motions, and we can watch anything that might hit, um, we can see the electrical components change uh, in their orientation relative to the pieces they're supposed to be detecting. Uh, it's very handy, but for this purpose it really just kind of looks good. And I wanted to focus a little bit of uh, attention on why we chose 24 keys instead of 25. So there's a couple reasons. Um, most two octave keyboards on the market uh, would typically add the top C key. So you have two octaves plus a C key at the very top, so you can you get sort of a unified look, especially if you're in C major, you get that last octave, your pinky's on a key. Um, we, uh, there's a couple reasons why we decided to not do that. First of all, we're already fairly narrow uh, in, an, in the iPad form factor, so by dropping one key, we increase the width of all the keys a little bit so that we're a little bit more playable. Uh, we didn't want to get them any more narrower really than this. But the big advantage, I think, um, is that our keyboard, because it's fairly thin and low profile and the keys are already fairly close to the edge, uh, has the, the option of being joined to another of its mates. And we'll have little clips for this purpose. Uh, as many as you want, really. <laughs> but you can imagine, here we have now a four octave keyboard because B from the one keyboard lines up with C of the next keyboard. And if you're a pianist at all, you know, really, you'll appreciate having this extra real estate so you get two hands on the keyboard. Um, the possibility of having a six octave keyboard in something the size of 
three iPads, uh, I think is pretty compelling for anybody who's ever traveled with a keyboard. Um, most portable or road keyboards will be e are, are even less. They're actually only five octaves, and yet they'll be quite a bit longer. That still takes up most of this table. Um, so we think that the ability to just carry two or three to get four or six octaves in a package, which is really just, you know, this times you know, three, three slabs of that thing. It's very, very small, very portable form, form factor. I think it's really, really compelling. Again, we looked on the market to see what was out there, assuming that somebody, some frustrated pianist somewhere must have at some point commissioned somebody to make a keyboard that was a little bit more portable. And there is indeed, there are a couple products out there, um, but they mostly go about the problem just to, by just taking a standard electronic keyboard, sort of sawing it in half, putting a hinge there, flipping it upside down. And yes, that does get you into a suitcase that will go on to check checked baggage. And I'm sure it's a very nice keyboard, but I, it didn't really feel to us like something that, you know, even approaches this in portability. Something that's just something you don't even think about, you just stuff in your briefcase. Um, having a six octave keyboard potentially that you can just throw into a briefcase with your iPad or multiple iPads if you want to have lots of extra screen real estate. Um, I think it's very compelling. So the ability to join keyboards is highly valuable.